Hey there, glad you were able to tune in. I know it's not your friendly, familiar Steve face this morning. He is busy this weekend uh, with some big changes in his life, hopefully a big move for he and his family. Um, we are glad that you're tuned in this morning. I know that having services in your living room or kitchen table or wherever it has been um, is not the easiest thing in the world. And so I can imagine that some of you may be wanting prayer or uh, need help in some way. So we would just encourage you to reach out to us. You can email us at staff at Woodbury Church. Many of you, of course, have my cell phone number. Feel free to text or call. We want to do whatever we can to be serving you. I do want to draw your attention to an email that you should have received. Um, the elders, of course, have been working and studying and deliberating um, on a path forward concerning women's roles for our church. As many of you know, this has been an ongoing conversation, which we studied last fall. They're ready to present the path forward, and we just want to make sure that everybody in our church family is aware that on Saturday, September 12th, we are going to gather together virtually, uh, and the elders are going to share with us their conclusions about this topic. Uh, so if you can be with us on Saturday, September 12th at 9 a.m., we would love to have you. We will be sending out a uh, Zoom link later so you have that. Uh, if you can't be there, we will record uh, the session and we will email you a private link. This is for our church family. It's an in-house discussion and uh, we just want to make sure that everybody has a chance to kind of know what's going on. All right, this morning you are going to hear from Luke Morgan with some communion thoughts. You're going to hear from Travis Edwards with our shepherd's prayer. There's many things to be praying about. Uh, you're going to hear from our praise team. And then we are going to be in part four of Church Myth and Mystery. So looking forward to that. Hey, church. This is uh, Friday, so I'm, I'm a little bit messed up here. But Rex Turner day before yesterday, so Wednesday, he had his surgery, and it was an answer to prayer, and it went well. There was a bigger mass attached to more things than they wanted, but the the surgeon, it, they got it all. They think we're in, he's going to be healthy. Oh, by the way, Rex Turner is Shauna's dad. I don't know if I mentioned that. He is struggling with heartburn and other pain. He's scared to eat because he had such bad heartburn. Anyway, uh, the pathology of the tumor is unknown, whatever that means. It's for sure unknown to me. Um, I'd like to pray for Netta's sister. She's got a, our little baby sister. She's about uh, three or four months old now. That's uh, big things are happening. I, I don't know. But uh, just pray that God can be working, that, uh, that we can witness to Netta's mom. Her name is Jackie through this. Um, uh, the Aragian family is requesting our prayers for health and healing. I know that uh, Australia has been battling a lot of stuff, basically blindness, uh, diabetes. Um, there's a friend of Pam and Leon's, I think, in Texas. I could be wrong, but... He had a head injury. I think we prayed about him last week, but his prognosis is getting pretty grim. He's got COVID now. Um, uh, we have had a good reminder of why we are socially distancing and wearing masks at church and meeting outside, for that matter. We've had members of our church family test positive for COVID. They were last in attendance on the 16th of August. The countrymen's are moving. Well, actually, they moved. I guess they moved out of their house yesterday. While you're what, on Saturday, and Lord willing, they're closing on their house on Wednesday of next week. So they'll need some help with that. Uh, don't book your evening, I guess, on Wednesday, and uh, maybe we'll get in touch with you to come and help. There have been a lot of road bumps in this buying process, but I think. Uh, think it's going to go through at this point it could change I, uh, our prayers are uh, we we need to be confident in our father that he loves us and he will answer our prayers but I have a current favorite verse I'd like to read it's a it's in Daniel um, the ninth chapter 
So in this whole chapter, Daniel's kind of apologizing to God for how um, badly his country has messed up. He's taken responsibility for them, even though, if, as far as I know, Daniel never messed up, but I'm sure he he wasn't perfect, but he's taken responsibility for the nation of Israel, worshiping idols and doing all the things that actually put them in captivity. And this prayer, his whole this whole chapter is a prayer. Um, then down in verse 18, he he just really he gets it. It's it's pretty awesome. Let's see here. I'll I'll, I'll start in, in uh, yeah. I'll just read verse 18. Oh my God. Incline your ear in here, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. When we pray, we're not praying, all right, God, answer this prayer because I'm so good and I deserve you to answer this prayer. I should live forever. I should never be sick and be 10 foot tall and bulletproof or whatever, but we're praying, Lord, uh, (laughs) we realize that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve death. We deserve hell. But because of your great compassion, we know that you love us and will answer our prayers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your sacrifice it's uh, hard to even imagine the compassion that you have for us lord the the love that you have for us that you would you would give your son to solve our problems pray that you would be with the health of the people that we've been uh, praying about be with our church be with our flock lord help them to uh, be at peace in this uh stressful um just uh i don't know a world that is hurting that we have uh, so many many people that are in fear of death they're in fear of uh, retaliation in fear of uh, the police fear of uh, so many different things that we're scared of right now lord help us to put our trust in you and not fear man because we have eternity taken care of by you. Um, Lord, I thank you so much for uh, the, the opportunity to be part of this family. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be with you again this Sunday. Uh, for those of us who are still worshiping from a distance with us, um, it's time to begin thinking about communion. And I'm happy to be here to share a few thoughts with you. Um, you know, for the last few weeks as a church, we've been listening and thinking about what it means to be a church. And an idea that I've been drawn b- back to in my own thinking and in conversations in our small groups is the role that expectations play in the way that we approach our experience as part of church. And we've talked a lot about how our expectations may affect our perception and our sense of fulfillment that comes from worship and what worship means to us. Um, but I was thinking I've also really been known to let expectations take over this communion moment. And I don't know if you're in that place right now. You may not experience that problem, but I want to share a few thoughts this morning uh, with that in mind. So like many of us, I've been caught in this kind of tension between um, how communion can feel mundane because we do it every week, because we often repeat the same actions. We sometimes even repeat the same words, the same prayers. Um, and the sacredness that it is supposed to represent. You know, I remember elders at churches I've been at reminding us that this is the center of our faith. And sometimes those two things don't feel like they can coexist. And to make this harder in some ways, the issue is really not so much how communion is presented or conducted for me. The issue is more the expectations I've set for myself in that time. So increasingly, like a lot of us who are worshiping on the lawn, and and maybe some of us that are at home as well, uh, my wife and I spend a lot of our church time and a lot of our communion time chasing our son around the lawn. He's having a great time. He's delighted. But sometimes it does not conform with the expectations we may have set for this time that we spend in communion, um, time that we often expect to be reverent or quiet or contemplative. 
And right now I don't have a satisfying answer. Um, amidst so many other troubles, it may seem insignificant, but in this too, I, I don't have an answer for you. But as we prepare for communion, um, wherever you are, and whatever expectations you've brought to this moment, I do want to share a couple reminders that I found helpful as I was trying to uh, do the same work and be prepared for communion. I've been reading Richard Rohr, who's a Franciscan priest and a theologian, and in The Universal Christ, he writes two things that I want you to hear. The first is this. You are a child of God and always will be, even when you don't believe it. And just a little later, he says, I have never been separate from God and nor can I be except in my mind. I want you to know you're welcome in this moment, where you are and whoever you are. It's enough for the God who made you and loves you. So as we begin communion, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the elements that you have given us that remind us of your broken body and the blood you shed. Thank you for the ways that you love us through these symbols. Thank you for the ways that these symbols become real in our lives and in the relationships and the love we experience in the world around us. During this time, remind us that we are enough. Remind us that you love us and that the only distance we can set between us is the distance that we have designed for ourselves. Help come closer to us. Help us come closer to you in this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks. Hey, it would be so helpful if you could open up your Bible and turn to like a section called First Pandemic Chapter 3. Because then you could look in there and scroll down to where it says, like, how to handle Christians who disagree about masks, or what does the Apostle Paul say about, uh, you know, spreading the disease and social distancing? Or why didn't James write a little letter in his, uh, in a little section in his letter um, about what do you do when someone you love posts conspiracy theories on Facebook? That would have been really handy had he done that. Or maybe Peter could have written the Christians um, how, to, how to manage social distance learning or political polarization in congregations. It would have been great if they had really anticipated all the things that we were dealing with in the 21st century and written specifically to them. But that's not the way the Bible works, unfortunately. We are in week four of Myth and Mystery. I've really enjoyed studying about the church, kind of this high-level view of what the church is and does, and trying to uh, unravel maybe some of our bad ideas. Now, we don't necessarily get very excited about discussing church as a topic, and I think it's because we have often misunderstood uh, the church conceptually. Um, so essentially, I've been saying the same thing every week. I've been talking about how the church was specifically designed to glorify God, just like we all all are, but the church is organized in this special sort of unique way. And then together, despite our differences and difficulties, we glorify God as a church together. And then we talked about how worshiping as a church glorifies God in this really kind of profound, specific way that doesn't always look like we think worshiping does. Now, if you've grown up around church, uh, what I'm going to say is going to sound very familiar, specifically if you've grown up around churches of Christ. Uh, so you've likely heard that the ideal church would be just like the first century church. Um, so the idea is, is that the earliest churches were kind of like the original model. They're like classic church. And, and through the years, over the millennia, we've added stuff. And we just needed to tear all that stuff away and get back to the original. Sort of like uh, new Coke versus classic Coke. You know, classic Coke, why mess with the recipe? It's perfect just the way it was. So the idea is that restoring the church is like restoring a classic car. You know, you scrub away the dirt and the rust and, you know, all the junky paint, and you just restore it to its former shining glory. Let me give you an example of this process in action. Um, there is this church in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, uh, called uh, the church at Troas. And we don't know a lot about it, but we get this fascinating story uh, about this church. So it says in verse 7 of Acts chapter 20 that we, this is Luke writing, but he's with some other guys, including Paul. We came together on the first day of the week to break bread. So as people who are trying to restore the first century church, people look at that and they say, okay, the first day of the week, that is Sunday, 
Check. And breaking bread is often a euphemism for communion. Check. So we do communion on Sunday. In fact, Acts chapter 20 verse 7 is the only place in the New Testament that explicitly states when to do communion. I've heard that all my life growing up. We read that verse because that tells us when. So that's like uncovering the original and then we anchor our practice in that verse. We've heard that all our lives. So to restore the first century church, that makes sense. That's very appealing to a lot of people. Uh, We find an example in the New Testament scriptures, and then we use that kind of like as our building block or our cornerstone to determine what we need to do, sort of like step-by-step directions, you know, for how you do this. There's one little problem. The The phrase first century church sounds like this simple a genuine earnest ideal, but it kind of encompasses a lot of complexity and assumption in that phrase. Um, In fact, in the first century, in the scriptures, there were actually a a big variety of churches. So which ones do we model? Because they often had different practices. Um, How do we tell the difference between a clue that we're supposed to follow in practice and just kind of a general description of what a church was and did? In fact, most of what we read in Scripture is not about what we should do, but what about what we should not do. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they said, don't get drunk at church. Well, there's a lot of latitude there. There's one thing we should not do, but then what do we do? And then also, and maybe most importantly, the restore, the first century church, is an ideal, but I wouldn't necessarily be able to argue that it is a biblical ideal. Meaning we don't have a verse that we can go to that says this is how churches in the 21st century are supposed to function. This is just kind of a, a, a way of thinking about it. Um, so I, I want to propose that the ideal church actually follows a different path. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we shouldn't take communion on Sundays or anything like that. I'm just saying the way that we arrive at those conclusions is incredibly important. And you're going to see why. I want to propose that we be an ideal church, but maybe that the ideal church is to be the 21st century church. Remember, we're talking about glory in this series, and so I want you to kind of keep your ear tuned for that word, or if you're looking at your Bible, make sure you're looking for that word. So take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and we're actually going to start in verse 1, right at the beginning. It goes, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. So Timothy is kind of a co-author in this book. It's very interesting. We often give Paul all the credit, but Timothy and others were often there with him writing. Um, But it says, to God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, that's where they are, together, now this is important, together with the overseers and deacons. This is actually the only letter that Paul addresses the leadership of a church. He talks about leadership, but this is one of the few places where at the beginning of the letter, Paul says, hey, I want the whole church and the leaders to be paying attention to what I'm saying. So you get the impression that Paul is going to be talking about the function of a church. And that's really valuable to know as we uh, embark in this letter. So, verse 2, he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Very standard intro. Verse 3, I thank God, uh, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And then he says, verse 6, Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, this is the beginning that you, uh, you begin to sense what this letter might be about. Um, and I think what he's saying is something along the lines of, Church, you are, par- you are in process. You are mid-remodel. God is not going to bail on you. Trust the process. Now, you begin to see, okay, Paul is establishing what he's going to be writing about in this letter. Verse 7. It is right for me, he says, to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains, and I want you to pause there just for a second. Whether I am in chains. Spoiler alert, if you've never read Philippians before, Paul is actually writing from 
prison. He's writing from some sort of house arrest. And I think it's fair to point out that if your like, spiritual leader were in prison, you might be having second thoughts about the whole endeavor. Like, is this what happens? Is this the end result of this sort of faithfulness? So you can see why they would, Paul would say, God is going to complete a good work in you. Because maybe they were beginning to wonder if good things were going to happen. Because their mentor, their spiritual guy, was in prison. But go on. Verse 7, he says, It's right for me to feel this way since I have you in my heart, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. All of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Verse 9, and this is my prayer. Now this is really crucial because most of these letters, they intro with some sort of prayer. And if you pay attention, you'll notice that these prayers are often summaries of what the whole entire letter is about. They function kind of as like a little way to get an idea of what the themes are in the letter. That's true here as well. So pay close attention to what Paul is about to say. He says, and this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. There's our word. There's a uh, common movie trope, uh, you've seen it, it's in hundreds of different kinds of movies, where there is this apprentice, he's, he's got raw talent, he or she has raw talent, but no discipline. And they have to train under a mentor. So think like Luke Skywalker or the Karate Kid. They have to find a Yoda or a Mr. Miyagi. And that mentor takes all that raw talent and begins to focus it and gives them all these tasks for training and so, you know, you remember if you've seen the Karate Kid, wax on, wax off, you know, or Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. They're teaching them, they're training them. But there's always the, this pivotal point in all these movies where the hero, the young apprentice of the movie, is faced with a situation that he hasn't yet been trained for and his mentor is nowhere to be found. And he has to face this situation completely alone. And he realizes, oh, all that painting the fence, that wax on, that wax off, that was for this moment. And he navigates this unfamiliar and new moment given the tools that his teacher, his mentor, has given them, given him or her. When I read Philippians, I get a sense of that same dynamic. This letter is from Paul in prison. Yoda's gone. Mr. Miyagi's not there. And then he says, listen to these words very carefully. Verse 9, and this is my prayer, that your love, y'all, you guys, remember we've talked about that before, may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Very important phrase. Verse 10, listen, so that you. Now we could pause there for a long time, but that is such a valuable turn of phrase to pay attention. Paul is saying, I want you to have love and knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. Now, Paul picks up on this theme later in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. This is a familiar passage some of you will have heard before, where he says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now in my absence, Mr. Miyagi's not there, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I don't know about you, but to me it sounds like Paul is saying it is time to take off the training wheels. It is time to lift the bumpers off the bowling lane. It's time to join the big leagues. Most of you uh, who have had kids or small kids or some of you, many of you who still have small kids, you've gone through uh, this phase, of course, where you have to go through a very specific bedtime routine every single night. And so when you tell your child, hey, maybe it's your six-year-old, and you say, hey, bedtime, it's 7.54, and I want you in bed by 8, and you go through this routine. You go through, we call it potty teeth and jammies, and of course, you know, there's always the, the interruptions where they want to drink and whatever. 
But there's this routine. It's the same routine every night. And every once in a while, as a parent, you probably have wondered, maybe tonight's the night where my child is old enough to navigate this situation on their own. I mean, we've done it thousands of times now. And so you tell your six-year-old, you say, okay, go get ready for bed. And you give them five or ten minutes, and then you go check on them to see how they're progressing. And you find them in the room with their pajamas on their head, and they're doing somersaults on the floor or something like that. And you're like... In 1,095 times of getting ready for bed, never once has what you're doing been part of the process. Like, what is going on? And you realize that they are not ready for that sort of independence, and you've got to continue to walk them step by step. But one day, one day, in the distant future, there will come a time where you not only do not have to walk your child through that process, but you as a parent, and I know this sounds unbelievable if you have small children, you as a parent may actually go to bed before your children. And what you may do is as you are on your way up to bed because you're old and tired, you may say to your child, hey, will you go to bed at a reasonable time? You don't have to go through each step. You don't have to go through each process. Now, this is important. The goal of both those approaches, both those settings is the same. You want your child to get a good night's rest so they can take on the day, whatever. But the path to achieving that goal is going to be different for different children at different ages and with different personalities. It's going to be constantly different. Philippians chapter 1 verse 10, he writes, so that you may be able to discern what is best. And then in Philippians 2.12, he writes, work out your salvation. Work out this this redemption into every corner of your life. It's the same goal, glorify God, but there are different paths to that goal, and now it is time for you to own the process. Navigating that path in Christianity requires discernment. It's a key word in that first uh, passage we read. Somehow, and I don't know when and where this happened, but somehow in many churches, we accepted the idea that the ideal church would look for step-by-step instructions to follow as precisely as possible, and that would be exactly what God wants. But the Bible itself, listen, the Bible itself encourages us to discern the path forward. Not look for turn-by-turn directions, but to discern the path forward. Now, some of you may be thinking, I don't know, you seem like you may be picking and choosing. Maybe that's just Philippians chapter 1 and you're reading it in a certain way. Well, Romans chapter 12 verse 2, very familiar passage. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this fresh mind, transformed mind, renew mind. You have to be thinking clear. Then you will be able to test and approve. It's the same word in the Greek as discern. Approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You discern what God's will is. Not uncover in scripture, discern. Now, we're going to deal with that in just a second in case you're getting worried. But I want you to also see Hebrews chapter 5, 14. Unknown author, uh, but a familiar passage as well. He writes, or she writes, But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have had their senses trained to discern, there's that word again, same Greek word, good and evil. Your senses need to be trained and then you can discern out in the world good and evil. I believe God expects the church that glorifies him to be a discerning church. A church that desires to discover what glorifies God in our century, and in our context. Now, let's dig just a little bit deeper into that word discern, because I think it's sort of a spiritual virtue that is unsung and hasn't gotten a lot of attention over the years. Discern. What is to discern? I don't want to uh, stereotype teenage boys, but I will. Um, They don't often, or maybe I should say it this way, they often don't make decisions that seem completely in line with what other (laughs) humans would do. Um, So, for example, they might look at a trampoline and a roof and a pool and there's some calculations going on in their head and they think, I can jump from that roof to that trampoline and then do a backflip into the pool. It's what goes on in, in the head. 
Now, a parent, if they happen to catch them in time, might say, son, you are very smart for a teenage boy, but you lack the ability to realistically play this scenario out. The glory you think that you will achieve on that black backflip is actually just going to end you in the ER. That would be discernment. Long story short, I've had my share of broken bones as a teenage boy. Discernment takes what we do know, the concrete, objective truths that we do know, like physics, gravity, human bone density, and then it maps them out into new and unfamiliar territories, like roof, trampoline, pool, emergency room. So as the teenage boy grows up, he can, in turn, as an adult, help his son discern that, hey, jumping off the back deck with a pillowcase as a parachute is not going to work. Now, I want you to hear something, because this is important. God's word doesn't change. But God's world seems like it is constantly changing. I mean, we are often in unfamiliar waters, unfamiliar territory, and, and asking ourselves questions like, what does it look like to be a faithful church in the midst of a pandemic? How do we lovingly handle a friend or family member that is posting conspiracy theories to Facebook? Those are situations that we cannot find book and chapter and verse for in scripture, and it requires discernment. If we tried to use the Bible as a step-by-step -step formula for exactly how the church is supposed to operate, take, for instance, the book of Acts. It's an it's a incredible book full of his, the, this historical perspective on the early church. But man, they were facing different crises, it felt like, every day. I mean, we, I wish we had time to go through it. I've been working on a sermon series about Acts, so maybe someday we will. But it just feels like every chapter there's some sort of existential crisis that they're having to navigate. Just something new and different and unfamiliar. Just read it. So if we were to look at the book of Acts and try to say, okay, what is the exact model? How do we restore the first century church? We're going to have to wrestle with some interesting questions like, uh, do we meet daily? Like we see uh, the, the Christians in Acts did in Acts chapter 2. Do we meet every single day? And some of you are like, well, yeah, I would do that. And some of you are like, <laughs> no, once a week is more than enough for me. Or do we meet weekly like we actually see Christians doing later in Acts? Which, which one is the correct model? Um, do we meet in public places like they did, like in the temple and, and the synagogues? Or do we meet in homes like we also see that they did in the book of Acts? Maybe we should sell all our property and pool all those resources. Maybe that would be a thing. That's something that we see in the book of Acts. Or maybe we should hold on to our property and use it to host other Christians like we also see in the book of Acts. Maybe, like in Acts chapter 20 verse 7, I should preach all night. How about that? No, you don't want that. I don't want that. The deal is, in Acts, these disciples were attempting as a church to be faithfully flexible. I think that's an important phrase, faithfully flexible. They were discerning the best path forward for the glory of God in their unique circumstances. Even right now, we're having to be faithfully flexible. We're recording services. I'm preaching to a mostly empty room. That's a strange experience. Many of you have not changed out of your pajamas on a Sunday morning for months I don't believe that you're at home lining up your couches and chairs in rows just like you do at church. I don't believe you're having your kids pass the trays just like we do at church. I prob you're probably not singing nine songs just like we do at church. You're not probably offering an invitation like we sometimes do at church. We have faith been faithfully flexible in order to adapt to new and changing and unfamiliar circumstances. But it's not about throwing away objective truth. It's about figuring out how to map that truth on to new situations. Those of you uh, that many of you have not been with us on the lawn uh, as we've been meeting outdoors and talk about faithful flexibility. <laughs> I mean, it is so interesting on a Sunday. First of all, if it's a nice hot Sunday, you wouldn't believe how valuable the real estate in the shade can be. That's a pretty important space. So people who were always late to church are all of a sudden showing up early so that they can get a spot in the shade. But we are doing individually wrapped communion. We've got these little communion cartons. They have they come prepackaged with a little uh, wafer and some grape juice, and it is terrible. It tastes 
awful. It tastes like styrofoam. In fact, there had been people who threw the wafer away because they thought it was some sort of like protective shell. It's awful. And we as a church are having to figure out how to be faithfully flexible. How do we take objective, eternal truths and then map them on to new and changing situations? I think it's so valuable. Let me say one last thing as we wrap this up. This conversation makes people nervous. It really does. And some of you are probably sitting there. If you've continued to make it with me, you're probably a little nervous. Like, hey, I don't know about this. I'm not sure. That sounds different. That sounds weird. People are rightly wondering, I mean, faithful flexibility. I mean, what if, what if we get it wrong and just go off the rails? Maybe we mean well, but we're just doing the wrong thing. Shouldn't we just find the book, chapter, and verse and do exactly what that says? I mean, how do we prevent our own biases from getting mixed up in all this? I mean, we all know Christians. We all know churches that have just sort of gone off the deep end. So, so what you're proposing, Patrick, sounds like it's just a recipe for disaster. Well, two things. Well, more than two things, but I'll try to limit myself. Uh, number one, unfamiliar doesn't mean ungodly. Unfamiliar doesn't mean ungodly. I know change is tough. I get it. But unfamiliar doesn't mean ungodly. I did literally read a book about one church that uh, they quit their church because the church was introducing scripture reading into the service, and they literally complained to the minister that too much scripture reading was, get this, unscriptural. They left because of change. Unf unfamiliar doesn't mean ungodly. But secondly, and this is valuable, and I think you need to hear this, we can sometimes find commandments, because we're looking for them, that don't actually exist. In, in, in fact, the problem of biases getting into our doctrine, our way of thinking, isn't just with flexible, it's with rigid as well. Um, in fact, if you want to do some extracurricular work, I would love to talk to you more about this, but really, dig out your Bible, turn to the book of Acts chapter 20, the verse that we use to anchor our practice of taking communion on Sunday, and read through that, and maybe ask yourself, when exactly... What day exactly did that church take communion? It'd be an interesting study for you to do if you're talking about what it means to find commandments in different places. Now, the concern is discernment leaves too much on us. I mean, honestly, uh, isn't flexibility or faithful flexibility, Patrick, isn't that just a euphemism for compromise? You can just let the winds of change blow you wherever they will. I mean, doesn't Ephesians talk about not being tossed to and fro? That The path to hell is, is paved with good intentions, Patrick. So what if what you're calling flexibility is just another way of saying, I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm just going to do what I want. I want to draw your attention, because Paul doesn't leave us just like flailing around, uh, you know, drifting on the ocean. I want to draw your attention to something that he does in many of his letters, but we see it so clearly in the book of Philippians. Um, and, and, and I don't actually want you to turn to these passages. You're welcome to write them down. But I want to reference them, because I want you to hear what Paul is getting at, this thread of, uh, of thought through this letter. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, he writes, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whatever happens. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Philippians 2, 14, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Good luck with that. Philippians 4, 5, let your gentleness be known to all. Wouldn't that be so helpful in some sort of argument or debate online? Let your gentleness. Or Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious, pray. Or Philippians 4, 8, it's so good. Think about things that are noble and admirable and excellent. Keep your thinking pure and right. And you'll notice that what he's doing is more often than not, we're not told exactly what to do, but we're told how to do it. And he leaves open so much latitude when he says things like everything and nothing. He's giving us this world of options. But here's some boundaries. Make sure you're being gentle. Make sure you're praying. Make sure you're thinking purely and nobly. Make sure you're, you're giving everything to God. Make sure you're glorifying God. There are boundaries, there are constraints, but within those constraints, there's a world of opportunity. 
In fact, there are commandments that we read in Scripture that are set in stone. I, it's never going to change that we are called by Jesus to love our neighbor. It's never going to change that we're called to go into all the world, like Genesis or, or uh, Matthew 28 says. It, those things don't change. But the way those commandments are implemented and lived out are going to change depending on what countries you live on, what streets you live on, the needs of your neighbors, your resources. The path requires discernment. When we lived in Iowa, when I was working at the church there, there was a wonderful woman in the church. She uh, just recently turned 90, and she was smart, well-studied, knew more about the Bible than I will ever know. I can't imagine what it was like to sit under my preaching when she knew so much more uh, than I did. But she was just a wonderful, kind, gentle, humble woman of God. She had two grandsons that she really was interested in getting to know Jesus. And so she tried to do everything she could. She would bring them to youth events. In fact, I remember specifically, we had some big youth rally, and it was just teens. And sometimes when you're doing things for just teenagers, things are a little bit louder than when you're doing them for the 80 and 90-year-olds at the church. The music's a little bit louder. The activities are a little bit more rambunctious. And she brought her grandsons out to this event, and it was going to get loud, and I warned her, and she said, oh, no problem at all, and it did get loud, and I just saw her tuck a couple little earplugs into each ear, and then she just kind of stood in the back and enjoyed watching her grandsons engage with other Christian young people. Um, and it, it, it was interesting because she didn't try to make the situation conform to her tastes and desires because, listen, that was not the goal. Sometimes to pursue the goal, to pursue the goal of bringing her grandsons to Christ, sometimes following Jesus requires earplugs. Because we as Christians need to be able to discern and navigate and be faithfully flexible as we try to do our very best to honestly and earnestly glorify God. That is what church is all about. All right, we have one week left of this sermon series. Steve is actually going to be preaching next week about what uh, church looks like or what a spirit-filled church looks like as it glorifies God. So I'm excited to hear about that. But for now, let's pray and, uh, and then let's be on with our day. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to have been able to gather for a few moments. God, I know that the things we talk about can be a little challenging maybe a little confusing or disturbing, but God, I pray that you would help us be people who are, uh, who are earnest and sincere and, and honestly desire to navigate our relationship with you in a way that glorifies you. God, we know that we won't always have a map. We won't always have turn-by-turn -turn directions. So God, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit uh, in order to be faithful and flexible Christians in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll talk to you next week.